Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. We have an awesome show with Tom Goodwin, innovation and business transformation consultant, author of Digital Darwinism, global keynote speaker, and one of the top rated voices in marketing. So get settled in and enjoy the trend show. Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast, a place for business leaders to get the best and most credible information on marketing, strategy, and innovation. Your hosts, Mark Binkley and Vasily Sturos, share their experiences as they gather insights from the world's leading experts. Now, on with the show. Awesome. On the show today, we've got Tom Goodwin. Tom is the in, or in innovation and business transformation consultant, author of Digital Darwinism, host of the Edge series, which is on Euronews and reaches over 250 million people, where Tom explores the future of business and culture through technology, voted uh, number one voice in marketing, and is a global keynote speaker. Tom, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. Oh, yeah. Me and I are super excited. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we're thinking about this. And we're like, how do we, you know, talk about something topical and timely that's like a bit contrarian? <laughs> and then we're looking around and then all of a sudden you post this thing on inter- on uh, LinkedIn. And we're like, oh, this, be this is perfect. <laughs> so thanks for joining us. So the theme overall today is generally why we shouldn't follow trends. But, um, you know, we'll dig into a lot of the trends that are out there and some of the challenges with following trends and why we're saying don't follow trends. So really excited to talk to you about this, uh, Tom. It should be good, actually. I think everyone's always talking about trends, especially this time of year. You know, it's it's the advent calendar and then there's the 2023 trends. So it's a timely moment to discuss it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, every year there's there's like literally dozens and dozens or probably hundreds of lists out there about those kinds of trends. There's a few examples that popped up and um, just want to kind of get your take on this. But I mean, voice search, blockchain, NFTs, Web 3.0, mass personalization. I feel like it's just such a buzzword, like keyword stuffing moment. Uh, 5G, Internet of Things, driverless technology, 3D printing, metaverse, ML and AI, agile, influencer marketing, beacons. Like it goes on and on and on. In general, like like... Do you see, is this a thing that you, I know you've commented on this in the past and part of digital Darwinism is about these types of trends and talking about uh, them in general. What's your general take on trends that pop up like this over and over again? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I mean, first and foremost, (laughs) I'm not miserable about the technology, you know, so I don't want people to sort of uh, hear me say this and me, you know, sort of misconstrue it and think that you know i think that smartphones are a waste of time and we should also live in caves in the woods or something um (laughs) i think the main thing is that they have become such a tool by companies um that they don't really mean anything you know like everything becomes a sort of Mm -hmm. portmanteau um everything becomes quite sort of vague and these things are really the sort of hopes and dreams and needs of a variety of different types of company um, who all want sort of pithy, you know, clever sound bites to make it seem, one, like they understand the world, um, two, to create a sense of sort of fear and paranoia that companies, you know, have to pay them lots of money, otherwise they'll be left behind. Um, mm-hmm. And we end up having really kind of facile conversations. I mean, you know, when, when we take that list of things, um, some of those things are technologies, some of those things are applications of technology, some of those things are sort of commercial names for a bundling of lots of different things together that don't mean anything some of them are kind of um mindsets um so we just end up having really stupid um unhelpful conversations as a result of that (laughs) i don't (laughs) so the reason the reason i'm chuckling is because so Mm -hmm. i in doing the research and and thinking about like how we want to approach this conversation I, i went and dug up even older lists right and yes. I found one from 2011. I'm going to read out a few of them. And I want to understand why these do not apply today, potentially. So the first one is like building reliable brand advocates. Second one is excelling in one area versus all being all things to all people. And then creating quality content as a viable marketing tool. So that was 
like three trends from a very highly reputable organization that came out in 2011. How are yeah. those things not trends today still? Well, well, they're not. I mean, um, I've been doing this for about eight years, I think now. I mean, I'm 20 years into my career, but I remember coming out with trends about 2011. Um, you know, the sort of iPad had come out. You know, we were talking about streaming TV. Yeah. Um, we were talking about um, the smart home. Um, and what you realize is every single year you sort of come together with a group of amazing people. Um, and realized that nothing had actually really changed. You know, you'd realize that mm-hmm. uh, the difference between the iPhone 5 <laughs> and the iPhone 6 had not made sort of Uber radically different. You'd realize that actually Airbnb was not really reliant on the smartphone. Yeah. Um, and then, so, mm-hmm. yeah, well, we can't really just do the same thing. So let's let's combine one or two. You know, let's combine AI right. with learning and call it image recognition. Um, let's combine 3D printing with the creator movement. I'm doing this in real time now, by the way, because it's this easy. Um, combine 3D printing with the creator movement, and we'll call it the democratization <laughs> of commerce or democratization of creativity. Yeah. Uh, metaverse, let's put that together with mass personalization, yeah. and then we'll call it like, um, I don't know, holistic living. Um, let's get <laughs> NFTs and, and blockchain and call it, you know, the um, tokenization of the world. Um, yeah. you realize that because things weren't really changing that fast, you ended up sort of cutting and slicing and marketing these things in ways just to sort of show people that you recognized um, that you needed to be on the cutting edge and you needed yeah. to be more outlandish. Um, because honestly, I look at the trends that I made in 2011, 2012, and they're all, it's not just that they're um, still relevant, it's that actually they're the most relevant things. And all of these other things have just sort of got in the way of that. Like, and you, you talked a little bit before about um, so a lot of those create a bit of fear, I think is how you said it. Um, and maybe a bit of paranoia. Maybe you're missing out on something. Is that is that what's is there something driving these? Like, why do people cre- keep creating these lists? You know what I mean? Like, is it just I've to create some this, kind of FOMO from? Yeah, I've created this movement called Nowism, and the idea behind this is. We are living at a really, really exciting moment in time. And we have really, really amazing technology around us. And we have incredible mm-hmm. business opportunities um, that can delight people and also allow companies to make loads of cash. Um, and for some reason, we don't want to do this stuff. We don't, we don't want to sort of look at advanced APIs. We don't want to look at containerized data. We don't want to look at inventory systems for retailers. Uh, we don't want to look at sort of total retail solutions. Like we'd rather sort of focus, it seems, on the metaverse or 3D printing. And I think mm-hmm. that's driven by a couple of things. I think um, the beautiful thing about these projects is because it's something that's not going to happen for a long time, you can charge people a lot of money as a retainer for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And because these things don't really exist yet, you don't actually have to do anything. I mean, you know, it, it, no, it's, a lot, it's a lot worse <laughs> to create a kind of um, a buy online pickup in store experience for Walmart because you actually have to go out there and dig up some concrete, you know, put some bollards in the ground, um, train staff on how to use it. And it's going to make a profound difference to the bottom line, but it's going to cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. Um, if you want to come up with a, you know, NFT luxury clothing fashion show in the metaverse, um, you don't have to deal with any of that stuff. You just make a nice PowerPoint presentation and get some agency in Serbia to knock up a video and you don't even have to build the thing and you still look like you've made something. Um, so that's mm-hmm. what's driving it is the, the stuff that we can do now um, that makes a real difference somehow. Um, it, it's more expensive. There's risk in doing it. You can get blamed if it goes wrong, whereas fanciful stuff, you don't have to. I, I love what you just said there, uh, Tom. I went and dug up one of your old posts from about six months ago where you had put together a compilation of videos of some of these outlandish things that I don't, sometimes they're coming from futurists, sometimes they're coming from people that are in, in various industries as thought leaders. And I remember I remember reading the one was around like, you know, the f- by 2020, what, 50% of total search was going to be done by voice. And what we're, we're just on the dawn here of 2023, and that's still not even close to, to being happened. But you, you close off your post by saying, like, there is no reward for being responsible, or sorry, for being reasonable, <laughs> helpful, nuanced, let alone correct. And I think that is probably one of the biggest reasons why we keep finding ourselves in data with these lists. And then we're all like, is that actually the direction we need to be going? Or should we just be mm-hmm. aware? 
it's very interesting to me. These things seem to kind of spark from somewhere and, and how true they are doesn't really matter. Um, I remember it's a, it's a different sort of trend, but I remember reading about quiet quitting a while ago and mm-hmm. I did some mm-hmm. uh, research into it and I actually realized there wasn't really such a thing. You know, actually um, what was really happening is a, a few people couldn't return to the labor markets because they had to look after loved ones, you know, because other people had passed on. Um, lots yeah. of people had sort of lost their job for, you know, health reasons, et cetera. Um, and I noticed that quiet quitting became Became this really big thing. It became repeated by everyone. And the moment that someone read it in the Wall Street Journal meant that someone else writing for Business Insider had to talk about it. And that meant that people tweeted about it. And that meant that anyone who works in you know, a planning capacity started tweeting about it. And these things become real, mm-hmm. even though they don't exist. Um, and I think that that's the sort of problem with this stuff is we tend to compartmentalize and simplify things into movements. And we say things mm-hmm. that feel like the words that we're supposed to say. And we're sort of cajoling mm-hmm. people into action. And actually, the fact that they're not remotely true um, is in no way unhelpful to these people. Um, mm-hmm. You know, saying things that turn out to be wrong never gets people in trouble. Um, I tend to sort of be less um, commercially. Um, it, I, I tend to sort of do less well because I tend to be sort of quite correct um, and quite pragmatic. <laughs> you know, helps. You know, it, like I remember going around retailers saying, "You really don't need to use eye beacons because no one's ever going to do yeah. this because you know privacy settings are such that it would freak people out." You know, what you actually you need to do is, is make sure that people can see if they've got your you know their size of suit in stock before they set out. Um, Mm -hmm. again there's a sort of yin and the yang to what I say I I, I can sound quite curmudgeonly about technology but what I'm really saying is that we're focusing on the wrong things Um, so rather than you know the metaverse is never going to happen there's literally you know for the the time in which we care about i.e. the next 10 to 30 years it's never going to happen physics shows it's not going to happen consumer behavior shows that there's no interest in doing such things Um, and I would love to go to Rita and say rather than spend your effort here you know, spend it on better staff training, um, send, spend it on, you know, um, curating clothing that has a sort of meaningful difference or clothing that's sustainable or, or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's a little frustrating. There's, I wanted to ask, there's so many things that you just said that I've just taken scrambling to take my notes here, but now is I want to talk to you about, you talked about, we're focusing on the wrong things. Um, but you also talked about sort of this echo chamber, which is where I want to just jump in right first, um, repeating messages. And so what gets repeated seems to be true, true even though it has no substance necessarily. Is there much truth, like preceding almost all of these things like voice and blockchain and metaverse and all that, you hear things like the rate of change is faster than ever has been unprecedented business model disruption. Um, <laughs> the corporate extinction is increasing. Uh, the death of fill in the blank always <laughs> happens. Like, is there much truth with those kinds of statements out there? Um, not really. I mean, I, I realize when I, I do quite a lot of writing on LinkedIn and, and you realize that um, there is always a temptation to simplify things to the point beyond which they actually are not really that true. Um, so if you say things like, um, you know, people are more empowered than ever before, you know, there, there's a little bit of sort of truth there. Um, but in the act of making it sort of pithy, um, you end up making it not true. Um, again, like it, it's because we need everything to sort of sound dramatic. Like if we said, you know, the rate of change today is one of the fastest rates of change has ever been, you know, but actually the 1890s were really crazy and the 1920s were enormously um, disruptive. You know, it, it doesn't do as well. Um, if you say under, you know, mm-hmm. business models have been um, um, disrupted at an unprecedented rate, you know, you should then probably define what you mean by disruption. And, you know, you're talking about a Clayton Christensen version or you're talking about more of a emotional uh, disruption. But I, I think the, the world of, of nuance and the um, tonality of precision are not really that helpful these days for people that want to get noticed for saying things. Hmm. You know, yeah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back to something you said earlier, just around the metaverse. And I couldn't agree more in the, in the idea that I think it's forcing organizations to think of something that is actually not going to help them in any <laughs> way, shape or form. But do you believe the reason why there's this incredible push around the metaverse is because of the investment that's happening by, say, like 
Facebook, uh, for example, as they're trying to carve out this this new new this new space, or why is there this just this myopic view of this metaverse is going to come in is going to help us do so many different things um, versus us just kind of like you know I love your example around retailers like just get retail right. Don't worry about all this other stuff. Get get your customer service to what people expect. Make sure you have the right supply chain. You have the right products, et cetera. But you have everyone just flowing and drops into this idea of like, how do we bring to life the metaverse? Where I think I, I agree. I don't believe that's the answer right now. There, there seems to be a very big gulf between what people are talking about um, in innovation and what people are talking about or thinking about. Um, you know, when I sort of started doing trends like stuff um, around about 2011, 2012, you could look at the trends and they actually were, they were quite aligned with how people were really behaving. You know, you could talk mm-hmm. about something like privacy trading, you know, something I still talk about today, but this idea that by sharing data, um, as long as people get something in return, they're quite happy to do it. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, we would talk about um, how the smartphone was going to be a more sort of intimate device that we'd have more immersive experience with we yep. talk about things like streaming there was stuff that if you said to normal people people would be like oh yeah that's kind of true yeah. um now most people are talking about the cost of living crisis you know most people are talking about um a media environment which is uh, making people a bit crazy and not like each other um mm-hmm. other things are um you know living in an age of sort of massive uncertainty quite a lot of emotional trauma um but the main yeah. thing by a long way is is the cost of living crisis which is huge um and has material impact on every single business out there in a way which could be quite catastrophic or could be quite interesting um mm-hmm. and at the same time time people are talking about nfts and sort of pictures of monkeys and um how nice it would be to have ice cream in the metaverse <laughs> and you can't help but think that these realities have become completely um removed from each other and i'm not sure I, I think part of it is i think a lot of working from home makes people not have the difficult conversations i think um mm. we, it's harder to be more discerning in a remote environment because you seem miserable um, you can't have the kind of wink to each other in a meeting where you go, look, you know, this was a bit of a waste of time. Let's not do this again. Um, so there's just a, an incredible amount of silliness. And I don't know if it's a response to people working remotely or whether it's just people want to um, be removed from quite boring, pragmatic conversations, which is slightly depressing um, about the reality of today. Um, but whatever the case is, it needs to change because technology is amazing and we can do incredible things and it can actually reconcile many of these problems yeah Mm -hmm. as you were speaking there one of the thoughts that i just had was in terms of trends and we're talking a little bit we're kind of bridging into innovation which is interesting as well and it i i'm just throwing this out there and love your thought on it but it almost seems to me as though like the idea of the appetite for reading these trends is almost like the appetite for innovation it seems to me that lots of companies want to be innovative (laughs) but they don't want to the cost and risks of being innovative. You know what I mean? There seems to be some kind of parallel there between how many people want to be in, I don't know, in, in the cool group because we're doing stuff that <laughs> they, around the metaverse, but it's not actually uh, putting the business at risk in any way. Think, is um, that, do you see yeah. that? Or do you think there's some truth? There? Yeah, no, I mean, the reality is, and um, it's taken me quite a long time to realize this, and it was a slightly worrying moment for me in my career. Um, but, <laughs> but actually, um, most companies don't have to change. You know, we say like the lifespan of a company on the S and P five hundred is, is is less than ever. That's not really true. Um, you know, if you rent cars, you can do as bad a job as Avis or as bad a job as Hertz and have incredibly shitty infrastructure behind you and lose people's bookings and not guarantee them. And they, they still survive. Um, this is not to say that companies should not change. Like companies should change, but because they can do amazing things and make way more money. But this is not a kind of battle for survival. Um, You know, I talk a lot about sort of opportunity-based innovation rather than sort of defensive innovation. Um, But most companies have realized, I think, they don't really need to change. What they need um, is to have sort of two or three images a year um, which show to the sort of financial markets that they kind of get it. You know, so there will be Mm -hmm. there will be a picture of someone. You know, take a Marriott. I'm sure there's going to be someone with with a sort of uh, VR headset plonked on their face um, on page three of Mm -hmm. the brochure. Um, There's going to be someone in the marketing department that's written something about NFTs and how they're looking into it. Um, And then there's going to be something else about how they're doing sort of corporate 
um, venturing by working with startups in with influencers or something. And these things are all very mm-hmm. peripheral, you know. So there's a budget, there's a person, there's a team. Um, their job is to do enough stuff that sort of creates merchandise that can act as a sort of a, a saber to the world just to sort of show people that they're doing a bit of it. Um, but if they really want mm-hmm. to change, they go out in a very different way. You know, they, they'd have like a chief innovation officer that's on the board. They'd be rethinking all their processes. They'd be rethinking how they work themselves. You know, they'd be rethinking their investment strategy towards hotels for the future. They would be, you know, rethinking what hotels will be. Um, in, in, mm-hmm. yeah, and they would yeah. be, um, you know, everything from ownership structure to um, franchise arrangements. Like it would all be different, but they don't need to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. You know, I'm not, I'm not sort of angry about it, but one should be quite um, pragmatic about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know how familiar are you with the, the Canadian landscape um, and some of the, the, the bigger box retailers that we have here. But just recently, Mark, I don't know if you've seen this commercial yet, but the Canadian Tired issued like a, uh, a virtual Christmas tree that you can, you can build in the metaverse. And they're advertising <laughs> it as your metaverse Christmas tree. And you can build it and then you can take it home. But then there's no like, well, how do you actually even go about doing so? Like, <laughs> is this, and I'm watching this and I'm like, someone checked the box somewhere that, hey, we're, mm-hmm. we're testing stuff in the metaverse and now let's just move on. And it just feels like this disconnect that gets created between what is the actual need we're trying to serve here versus, you know, what we're, we're actually putting out in the, in the ether. And I'm, it's increasingly frustrating. For me, at least, I, I think that's it. Like, um, again, my my tone is frustration because if you took that that money and that team and that energy and said, why do we create one outlet that's really amazing? Um, and I, we, why don't we do some social media campaign that is actually, you know, really helpful for people about how this is a perfect time of year to, you know, change tires to a different compound or something? You know, like yeah. companies only have mm-hmm. limited resources, um, energy and positivity are quite often the most scarce. Um, how can we make sure we do stuff to make people feel really proud of where they work? You know, how can we do stuff that, mm-hmm, that actually totally. makes a meaningful difference to people and, and people don't talk about it in cynical ways because it was good stuff. Mm-hmm. Kind of makes me think that I, V and I are both doing our MBA right now. And I'm in the innovation course at the moment. And, and one thing I keep coming back to is the deployment of resources. And I keep thinking about resources as time, people and money. Mm. And people, I, I keep putting in in terms of brackets like spirit or will or some yeah. some like it's it's not just that they're people, but your comment just made me think of that because it's almost like you can invest people's spirit into projects like this that go nowhere, which then have this short term effect of like oh we did this cool thing, but the more that you don't produce real results or is something totally impactful. <clears throat> it has this erosion almost on, I would imagine on a company and, and the morale of, of a, and the culture of an organization. Absolutely. I mean, the most, the, the most important thing for companies is to have sort of favor in a way. It's, you know, it's a sort of mixture of energy and optimism um, and, you know, the, the assumption that things will go well. Um, ideas do not die because people say they're nonsense or people say they can't be done. Ideas die because everyone goes, oh, yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, do not. yeah. No, I'm not going to. Yeah, but well, I'm away next week. You know, that's how I do that. Um, you know, it's, it's apathy that sort of kills these things. And I think when you do have the, the miraculous combination of money um, and a business lead and focus, do something really good with it and do something that gets momentum. You know, if, if you roll out the sort of store of the future for one location, then you can learn from that and then do another one mm-hmm. you know, across them um, on the other coast of Canada. Um, if you do that, then you can do the sort of digital store of the future or, you know, you can mm-hmm. be bigger next year. I think um, when we do things that are kind of evolutionary dead ends, like the metaverse, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what you can learn from it. I mean, if you sort of perfect the, um, customer experience in the metaverse. I, I don't know how useful that is to to take that learning and to, to, to sort of put that in a store, you know, where we grab mm-hmm. exists and where people actually have to sort of fit in doorways and stuff. I know it may be, at least to our listeners, it may seem like we're picking on the metaverse, but you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the reality is I think the only, the only conduit I can see is the continuous evolution of augmented reality. Right. And mm-hmm. I think, uh, 
iOS, like they pushed out a new, um, their Maps app right now, where if you're walking, you can kind of literally lift up your phone and it kind of gives you an idea and it orientates you, say, hey, you need to go south on on Blur Street here, for example. And I thought that was a very clever way of now kind of helping people. It's solving a problem. It's like sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, the signals aren't coming in quick enough. So the Maps has a tough time orientating where you are. But now adding that element of augmented reality kind of helps that. And I think that's the only thing potentially that can kind of help from a functionality perspective, any sort of investment in the metaverse. But I do not see it in the sense of truly immersing people in this digital room and carrying out your day-to-day lives, like shopping and et cetera. Like that's just, that's just ludicrous. I think so. Yes. <laughs> Tom, there's, um, and you mentioned this earlier that in terms of like, there's been lots of periods of change. Uh, mm-hmm. We're not in the only period of change. And so, you know, there's little tiny periods in, in human history, things like the scientific revolution, the age of enlightenment, uh, the Renaissance, industrial revolution. I mean, it, where we're at now, are we, should we be in terms of the age of the internet, should we be learning from some of these past periods of time or is there, is there things we're missing? <laughs> um, I feel like you're just giving me lots of questions to say yes to. Um, this is if you sort of read all my books or something. Um, <laughs> we may yeah, or may I not mean, have. It, it's really not that hard to, to understand um, the future if you kind of just read about this stuff. Um, every single revolution that comes about from a profound technology basically has sort of three stages. Um, there's a stage before it where everything kind of makes sense because we've got used to the old paradigm. Um, then this new technology arrives and everyone goes, wow, this is amazing. Um, no one really knows what to do with it. Um, the business models don't really make sense. And people try to kind of fit it around the ways they've done things before. Um, a nice example mm-hmm. of this is the first, um, the first steam engines were used to pump up water um, to drive water wheels. Um, the first mm-hmm. um, electrical motors replaced steam motors in, in factories um, and nothing else sort of changed. And, you know, for a long time, people think, well, it's nice that we've got the electric motor or it's nice that we've got computers on people's desks or it's nice that we've got smartphones. Um, but it doesn't really change that much. Um, then there's mm-hmm. this sort of last stage, which is when people now sort of understand the limitations and the possibilities of it, and they understand what it means to people and their behaviors. And then they tend to sort of rethink and build from scratch what they should have done around the power of that new technology. Um, and this is a very, very clear process that keeps on happening. Um, you know, it's one thing to give everyone a computer with an Excel spreadsheet on it and a calendar. It's another thing to get them to sort of rethink their jobs around the power of a database that's connected to everyone. Um, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think, um, there again, there's this sort of um, popular idea that these revolutions happen more quickly because everything must happen more quickly. And I'm not entirely sure that that's true, actually. Um, like it took maybe 30 years after the discovery of, of how useful electricity was um, not to create an electric iron, which was just an electrified version of something that existed before, and not right. to create um, an electric um, oven or an electric light, but to create the radio mm-hmm. or to create the telephone or to create the refrigerator, you know, things that have never existed before that electricity made possible. Um, and it was those things that really changed society. So that took about 30 years. Um, and I think probably the timescales for the digital age will be quite similar. Um, uh, some of my frustration comes from the fact that people keep on thinking it's the next big thing that we should be talking about. Um, you know, we must be bored mm-hmm. of our smartphones because people aren't that excited when they get the iPhone. I, I don't even know what it's called, the iPhone 15, the iPhone 14, I don't care. You know, the, the gap between the iPhone 2 and the iPhone 3 was huge. Um, actually, they didn't have an iPhone 2, did they? Um, so um, what, what, what you sort of realize is that um, people have sort of written off what we have now. They, they're sort of keen to think that VR will be the next big thing, that the smartwatch will replace the phone. Right. And actually, I think rather than being at the beginning of the end, we're kind of at the end of the beginning. Um, And this is the most exciting Mm. time because we get to sort of build the world that we should have. And is that what nowism is about? Is looking at not the next new thing, but looking at the things that 
are existing that we're not using properly or, or maybe underutilized? It's, it's basically exactly that. I mean, um, I haven't sort of defined it much further, but if, if I did, I would like it to be sort of customer centric. You know, how, how can we genuinely make things that are better, um, that improve people's experiences? Um, how can we use technology as a sort of lever for good? But yeah, the, the, the sort of primary um, flavor of it is this idea that we have everything that we need around us um, and we really have not taken advantage of it. You know, we, we, we still carry around, you know, dead trees as passports um, when there's actually no reason why um, we need them. There's no reason why we can't just use um, iris recognition or facial recognition. And that becomes your passport and your passport is just a permission in the cloud. Now, that technology has been around for sort of 15 or 20 years or something. Yeah. Um, we, we, mm-hmm. we, we keep on thinking that digital transformation really comes from applying a very sophisticated technology to how we work. And we think that the more sophisticated the technology is, the more we've transformed. You know, so if we use quantum computing, that's much more transformative, you know, than to just use um, multi-core processors or something. I don't think that's true at all, actually. I think the, the transformation comes from the sort of depth of its application. Um, so if you sort of augment how you work with computers, that's one thing. If you rethink mm-hmm. how you work um, and completely create new workflows and processes and protocols, if you do that around new computers, that's that's when the transformation happens. It's about the depth of its application. That is a great segue because one of, one of the questions we had here for you was around digital transformation. And we, we can appreciate how big of a topic that actually is. But I think at a, from a very high level, what do you believe is the things that actually companies are getting wrong with this notion of digital transformation? I, I think, um, again, in the last few years, I've come to realize that um, it, it's not that companies are being stupid. It's actually just that they have other priorities. Um, so most companies today of scale, you know, they're responsible for quarter on quarter reporting. Um, and ideally, revenue growth will go up every quarter. Ideally, profit will go up every quarter. Ideally, return on assets will go up, etc. Um, mm-hmm. They're a little bit like a, a, you know, I put about this in my book, but it's a little bit like an airport. You know, Heathrow Airport or, you know, Toronto Airport, or well, they're not perfect, um, but they kind of work. But this idea that you can take an airport, which is kind of working, and if it's foggy on one day, it really doesn't work, but then you hope the fog goes away and it normally does. Um, and sometimes there's leaky roofs. Like you can either sort of refurbish the inside of that airport and sort of make people a bit happier while they wait for their delayed plane. Um, or mm-hmm. you could sort of build on another terminal to the airport, which is extremely expensive. Or you could just sort of create a brand new airport from nothing. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think the reality is that the business case very rarely makes creating a new airport logical unless the whole thing burns down. Um, So companies are sort of existentially bound to basically refurbish themselves until something so catastrophic happens, either that they go out of business um, or, Mm -hmm. you know, they can sort of leap to a new paradigm in a different way. So I I think it's just that the incentives and the business cases and um, the needs of the market are such where companies really can't do this. Um, And like I said before, you know, in many cases they really don't have to as well. So, Yeah, there's, the success or you talked about that before the the companies don't have to change. Like there's again, one of those terms, if you want to call it that like innovate or die (laughs) memes, or if you want to call it, or, you know, failure is not an option. Like, you know, evolution has to happen, but it it is a choice. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to like things can be okay. Like it doesn't mean just because there's a new trend that you have to adapt and change to it. And it doesn't mean you have to like completely blow up your airport <laughs> and, <laughs> on your and own. So the structure I think is quite interesting. I mean, I think um, uh, I, I realized that if you're a large car rental company, the way to change is probably not to replace all of your core systems, but probably to invent a sort of five location startup that does things in a radically different way. And right. you use that to sort of test the market. You know, it's yeah. a bit like um, parents having kids. You know, you can either have sort of um, surgery to look younger or therapy to get used to the fact you're old, or you can have kids. And the the obvious way to keep your genes alive um, and to keep the spirit alive is, is to do that. 
And I think um, that provides a more useful metaphor, I think, for innovation. Um, how, can you create, That's interesting. Yeah, how can you create entities that are not you, um, but they're inherently linked to you? And how do you give them everything they that. need to ensure they can flourish in the future and carry you forward? Um, and that's not a recognition, you know, that, that's just uh, accept the reality is that things do die over a period of time. That's I, deep. Again, t yeah, I that's love that. Awesome, that's though. great. It's yeah. like we are the legacy of our parents, essentially. Yeah. I did a post on it on LinkedIn. It was the worst performing post I've ever done. Um, so I'm glad that you like <laughs> <laughs> Glad someone likes it. Um, there's in, in so I one of the presentations that I was watching of yours. Um, you talk about sort of the things that people are doing wrong or organizations are doing wrong when it comes to digital transformation, and you have this applied new tech to old processes. Um, trying to think about how tech combines in the future, and then humanity, not tech. Can you just kind of touch on some of those topics? Yeah, I mean, um, if, if you look at the way that people talk about business these days, um, you would assume in some cases that the businesses are there, you know, to invest in startups or the businesses are there to um, yeah. you know, write headlines about new technology. You know, businesses are there to make money and they often make money by selling things to people. Um, and therefore, our entire orientation should really be around people. Um, you know, there should be many more briefs which are saying – not we have 5G, what can we do with it? Not we have blockchain, right. what can we do with it? Not what's our e-commerce strategy, but just um, think of our customers, think of our potential customers, think of problems they have, mm -hmm. think of things they'd quite like to do. In a world where all of these technologies exist, and that might include 5G, but it also may include the smartphone or the desktop computer mm -hmm. um, or um, 3G um, or um, credit card details being stored in Apple Pay or APIs um, or, you know, um, Web 2.0 technology. In that environment, what things can we do or change or make um, that are going to improve the experience that people have? And I think when you do that, actually, it's much, much easier to come up with things which are quite pragmatic and um, cost effective and impactful. Um, but for some mm -hmm. reason, we seem to sort of want to worship at the church of technology, not of people. Yeah. So kind of coming back to that idea of like, it's, it's not the trend that matters. It's more what we can do with it and probably the trends this year, even if they, let's say they are radically different. Um, there's still tons of things we could do with the things that existed 10 years ago that we never touched before anyway. And to start with, I think it's really a good idea to think about the customer innovation or the customer and what, how we can innovate and improve on the existing service. Precise, not least because all, all of these technologies yeah. combine. You know, we don't live in a world where right. 3D printing, the Internet of Things, um, machine learning and VR headsets. We don't live in a world where those things are separate. We live in a world where they all combine with each other to create a sort of, you know, like a three dimensional canvas of, of opportunity. Um, and actually, mm -hmm. quite often, combinations of quite boring things create a more interesting canvas and combinations of really, really outlandish things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, like, when we're thinking about the, you know, everyone kind of being in their own in their own setting and organizations and whatnot, like, there's this focus of like, what what are those quick wins that we're trying to pick up, like, and and do, and no one's really having that conversation around, you know what are those true transformative opportunities? I know you loosely were talking about this throughout the, the podcast already, but do you think the core reason that no one's really looking down that path is because there is that inherent risk that maybe we get it wrong? Um, or do you believe there's something else to that, that we still kind of stay in that safe lane of like, yeah, let's do a commercial in the metaverse. No one's going to say anything. It's not going to be a thing, but we check the box and showing that we're innovative <laughs> versus really rethinking like the, 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 let's say, like a retail experience that may be more customer-centric? Yeah, I, I think um, one should realize that transformation is extremely hard. Um, mm. To really, really change involves 
a lot of things. Quite often it's money, but more than anything else, to really change, you have to go to the very core of a company. And if you go to a core of a company, that means you have different people from different departments being there. Um, actually, mm-hmm. one of the best examples of, of transformation I've seen is McDonald's. Um, you know, can you imagine how hard it's been to go to all of your McDonald's, especially the ones owned by franchises, um, and get them to install digital screens and then get them mm-hmm. uh, change the way that their um, checkout desk is arranged and then to put digital screens behind mm-hmm. that that show your order and then to put in a sort of process and the backbone of, of their workflow to, you know, show the orders coming in and prioritize them and so on. You know, that, that's a huge huge mm-hmm. undertaking you know that means the people yeah. from it had to talk to people from real estate he had to talk to people in mm-hmm. legal firms to talk about the franchises to talk about the finances of it and how it's going to be um amortized across different franchisees um the the conversation yeah. incredibly complicated so the moment you do something that's quite core cool, you have to involve very different departments all of which involve very different personalities different egos different um kpis so it's very 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 hard um, so the most obvious thing for companies to do is to sort of innovate at the edge because then that's just one department. So to, to mm-hmm. one store of the future that's done by the innovation team probably just means working within that team um, to do mm-hmm. a sort of, you know, influence a marketing thing um, with creators that probably just involves one person in marketing and an agency. Um, so it makes complete sense that the ones that the projects are prioritized are the ones that are quite impactful and quite easy. I think I then get a little bit annoyed that people then move towards things which are easy, but not impactful and then easy right. and yeah. completely pointless. You know, we'd rather do things that continue to get headlines, even though they don't make any difference rather than yeah. go from easy and impactful to hard and impactful. There's, I remember, I don't know if you were there, V, when we were doing this way back when, but we had this, V and I used to work together, Tom, and uh, there was a workshop that we had with the senior group of people at the organization, and we used a two by two. It was kind of like, what's going to be easy, what's hard, and then what can we do quick, and what's going to take a long time? And almost everybody's ideas were in the quick and easy <laughs> portion. And then, like, fast forward four months, we got none of it done. <laughs> <laughs> so your point about transformation being hard, it is hard. Yeah. But I also feel like there's some kind of, like, uh, short circuit in our brains about why we think certain things are so easy. And the McDonald's one is such a great example. Like, that must have been monumental to have a, agreement and alignment on that considering all the groups of people globally that were involved in putting up a screen, essentially, that you could just tap an order on your own. No, I mean, like, Why do we get that? Why is that so hard for us to get that part right? I think um, because it's almost impossible to create the business case to do that. I mean, the, the CapEx involved, um, right. the, the time to, to sort of service, you know, to install these things. Um, it's extraordinary. You know, you, you do tend to notice that they tend to be built into the new ones um, more than they're put into the old stores that need to be refurbished the most. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, it's quite a sort of telling sign of it. Um, but no, I think efforts like that should be really be rewarded. And and it's sort of fascinating because you look at something like that and, you know, it, it does mean that I order McDonald's in places that I would not have done so before because I just know it's going to be quick. Um, I, I know how long mm-hmm. it's going to take as well. I can see my number going down the list. You know, it's quite exciting. Um <laughs> so genuinely it's made a huge difference to the bottom line. But if you had to sort of express it in terms of the trends that we talked about before, you know, it's terrible. There's no, there's nothing to do with voice. There's no blockchain going on. I've not no. got an NFT from it. You know, didn't even use mm-hmm. IG. There's no 3D printing going on. You know, it looks like a <laughs> bit of a disaster. Um, mm-hmm. It's a very good example of very pragmatic technology that's been around for a while coming together um, and operating at a deeper level, which means it brings about real change. Where's my 3D printed burger, damn it? <laughs> <laughs> you bring a great point because like McDonald's not going to win any awards for that. It's not going to be on, no. you know, it's not going to be promoted anywhere else. But like the effect that that change probably had on their bottom line, streamline operations, efficiency, reduce human error, et cetera, et cetera. It's it's one of those no brainers that you'd have to look at operationally, but it's not going to be heralded as such because it's not. I don't know. Dare I say, sexy? Yeah, 
Yeah. There's probably an inverse relationship actually between things that make a difference and how much they get talked about. Um, you know, mm. uh, I look at yeah. like retail. I mean, reverse logistics is killing retail. Um, the, the promise of ever faster delivery for free. Oh, yeah. um, mm-hmm. the, these things are massive existential problems in, in retail. No one's talking about um, how no one's making any money from most types of fashion because clothes don't fit and people send them back. Um, mm-hmm. you know, that's not very sexy, but actually, you know, the technology that you could use to improve that is very rudimentary. Um, you know, no one's talking about in a world of sort of reselling, then in theory, luxury becomes more sensible because if you can resell your clothes later on for half the price you paid for it, then actually luxury clothes are not as, as expensive as they once seemed. Um, but then you think, mm-hmm. well, how can we authenticate the, um, you know, make sure they're not counterfeit using technology? Very easy to do with an NFC type technology, for example. But again, no one wants right. to talk about that. They'd rather sort of sell like a digital NFT of it or something. Mm-hmm. I struggle with there's that all these too. sound bites that are running through my head that <laughs> like posts that you've put up Tom like I, I for anybody that's listening or everyone that's listening uh like to- honestly follow Tom's post because yeah. like every day or it feels like every day you've got something really thought-provoking <laughs> and new that's in there um and you're talking about the one that just popped in my head as you're talking about that is that marketing focuses so much on insights um and then we apply it to ads instead of like sharing that information with product or customer experience and and thinking about ways to use the technology and the trends that are out there to improve something for the customer. It's a fa- it's like a, such a fascinating idea because it like whatever insights we get, we don't have to hold them for ourselves. Like we can do things with these insights. It doesn't really make any sense to me. I mean, it first hit me about um, 2006, um, where someone at Nokia had made a phone um, that had GPS and um, a really good music player and a really good camera. And they were like, right, okay, um, how are we going to sell this? And no one really knew because those combinations of things didn't really work that well. And then they did sort of more research on the consumer audience and they, you know, they sort of found out that they liked sports and stuff. So then we had to try and do this campaign where it was about sport and the fact that with GPS and music, you could probably listen to your favorite sports music on the way to the stadium using GPS. And he thought, wait a minute, like this is incredibly far-fetched and, and impossible and unnatural. No, but what if we'd taken all of those user behaviors about their passions? What if we'd really understood what people wanted and then put that into the phone creation process? You know, then we would have ended up with radically different products to what we were trying to flog. And this idea that the entire factory line basically churns out millions of devices and then they're sort of given to marketing on the last day and told, you know, go sell this. It's, it seems sort of catastrophically stupid. Um, you know, in advertising, we're full of expressions like, you know, busy mums and, um, all right, well, we'll mm-hmm. make a product for a busy mum rather than do an advertising campaign that sort of patronizes them. Um, you know, what, if we, if we accept that people are busy, you know, why don't we make it really easy to buy stuff? You know, why don't we save your shopping list and, um, auto generate items that you really might want? You know, why don't we make it easier to choose a hotel to stay in at the weekend? Um, but no, we'd sort of rather just use it for advertising. That's such a, like, I'm just thinking about all this stuff and like how, how, actually I'm going to, I'm going to go in a, not really a different direction, but like for me, what this really starts kind of boiling down to is like customer centricity and really understanding your customer and really understanding, you know, the nuances of how you can be a better service provider or a better retailer or whatever, you know, insert, you know, industry here, so to speak. So where do you believe that the disconnect happens between customer centricity and the the fact that everyone wants to be that but it's actually not being actualized on on the other side even though we have technology we have insights we have all this incredible information at our fingertips and organizations still struggle with this idea of how to be genuinely customer centric um because i don't think they really mean it i think it's just one of those things that you say um you know, if they were, you know, if you look at their org chart, you know, I'm not, I'm not expecting them to have an org chart with, you know, me or you at the center of it and all these sort of departments being like, you know, chief keeping Tom happy officer. Um, I'm not expecting that. But if you were to do, um, if you were to do an org chart of like a car company, 
um, or um, a grocery store or a hotel chain or a bank, you know, 99% of that infrastructure and the staff is going to be about the kind of factory itself. Um, right. You know, the you know for banks, I think they think of people as being the sort of people that give them capital that allows them to make money. Then they're almost like a supplier, not like a customer. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every time you sort of leave an aircraft, you sort of feel like you were the sort of slightly annoying cargo for them. You know, they'd much rather have, have just had normal cargo rather than a cargo with mouth. Um, so we're the sort of things that get in the way. Um, and I think most companies are subconsciously orchestrated to turn their back to us, with the one exception being the marketing department. So the marketing department gets to be the, the voice of the consumer. The marketing department gets to address the consumer. Um, but increasingly, mm -hmm. that role um, has had most of its power removed from it. So if you work in marketing and you think that actually you should train your call center staff better, you know, because call center staff are really marketing, you know, the operations team will probably tell you that you're out of your mind um, yeah. and that, you know, there's not enough money to do that. And actually they're looking to outsource some of that to robots instead. Um, so I think marketing doesn't really have enough power. And these things have become quite vicious cycles, really, where I don't think we necessarily have the best marketers in the world that are walking into the right meetings, that are saying the right things, um, because companies are not taking it as seriously as they should. Hmm. The, and we, a lot of the examples we talked about are B2B, and I know a lot of the, or sorry, B2C, and I know a lot of um, the episodes that I was watching anyway on The Edge, which are super interesting. They're, those are great, by the way. Thanks. Um, yeah, or around B2C. And I'm just wondering, is, is, is this equally applied to B2B companies as well? I, I feel like some of the technology and the production stuff would be apply there, but are, are, is there as much opportunity for B2B to get it right as there is B2C? Um, potentially. I'm definitely not like a B2B expert. Um, yeah. I think the, the one thing I'd say about B2B is it is quite different because people's motivations are normally slightly different you know if i'm trying to buy mm -hmm. myself you know i want to have something that makes me look like i'm really successful i want it to sort of be fast and fun you know i care a lot about the sort of servicing of it if i'm buying cars for a whole fleet of people i just want to make sure they don't mess up um the yeah. risk avoidance and making decisions that appear to be logical is the most important thing in b2b um, time also becomes kind of less um, helpful. And often money doesn't really mean anything. You know, lots of people quite like spending more money than they have to um, to fly a nice mm -hmm. airline because they know they don't have to pay for it themselves. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of fundamental dynamics that we're talking about, you know, the levers to pull, the, the need to be customer centric, um, the need to create better products and services, you know, those are all true. So um, th there are similarities and differences. Mm hmm. There is one other question I've got, V, and yeah, yeah. I know you're stewing on something too, but again, <laughs> another recent post. <laughs> um, there's something that you talked about, Tom, in a recent post about, uh, I think it was maybe today or even yesterday, but uh, VC funding and how they're getting it wrong. Yeah. Um, and I just thought that was so fascinating because it's, either, I think you had the example, there's 250 pet Fitbits out there now. <laughs> and like, <laughs> It's a lot about just repeat. And so there's not uh, as much, um, I th you'll be able to say it better, but there's not as much emphasis on the originality of an idea, I think is part of how you talked about that. Yeah. Not, Can you yeah. just describe that? Because like, I, I thought that was such an interesting conversation. Uh, maybe a nice way to think about it is this, actually. Uh, I mean, I, I travel a lot and there was a period where you'd go to Italy and you'd be like, oh, look, you know, this is Casper, you know, D2C mattresses, but it's in Italy. Um, oh, look, they've got bird scooters, but it's in Italy. Oh, look, they've got, you know, 15 minute grocery delivery, but it's in Italy. And you'd realize right. the reason why these companies existed there um, was because it was very easy to get funding because all you need to say is, look, we're doing Casper, but in Italy. And then they go, oh, wow, Casper's mm -hmm. doing really well. Yes, it is. Um, you know, it's valued at this, which means if we scale it down to this market, then we should be worth that. And you realize that the whole marketplace really was designed around almost like a sort of recursive form of, of, of recreating the sort of future, you know, that there's sort of mechanisms for 
um, propagating what has worked before. Um, and the second thing is you realize that everything was incredibly driven by the sort of trend du jour. Uh, like other experiences mm-hmm. a lot in the pitches I get. Um, you know, 2006, every pitch would be a sort of eye beacon pitch. 2008, everything would be a, a 3D printing pitch. And the, and the pitches mm-hmm. would always be, you know, we use 3D printing to, you know, make um, the world the better place. You know, and the technology became the idea in every single example. And it's still very mm-hmm. much like that now. Um, and I think um, it, I, it just made me realize how sort of formulaic the whole thing was, really. Where it was all about having a clear exit strategy so that the VC uh, company can get their returns as quick as possible. Um, it was all about having a process which was very logical that you could sort of defend to other people. And it was all about maximizing odds um, but only by using data from the past rather than projecting it forwards. Um, and again, like all of the things I say, like I, I don't want the takeout to be, wow, Tom's really miserable and he thinks that VC is shit. Um, <laughs> I, want, so miserable. I want it to be, I want it to be how good could VC be? Like if we've got all of these people putting in all this money who are actually quite happy for 80% of companies to fail that actually only need sort of one in 20 companies to succeed dramatically. Like if we have this amazing background of, of really smart people who are hopefully kicking the tires and doing really good due diligence and they're, you know, giving money to sort of thrusting ambitious people that want to create something for the world. You know, if we work mm-hmm. around those foundational elements I just think it could be a lot better, you know, like, uh, mm-hmm. and, and maybe these are companies that grow quite slowly. I don't mean very slowly, but, you know, I, I've always thought yeah. that a company like Airbnb would make an amazing medium sized company. Like it would be a brilliant sort of, you know, $10 billion company, but it makes a lousy $100 billion company because it has to get so big that you lose the spirit of it. Um You know, I've always thought that Uber for rural areas would be really interesting because actually that's where you need more help getting around because taxis don't exist. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I I think this whole space in companies that are are quite helpful to the world but can also make tons of money that are sort of driven by a real sense of imagination and a sort of passion for, for making things which make people a little bit happy or a little bit healthier. You know, I'm not talking sort of proper crunchy granola stuff. I just mean, you know, make it easier to find a bus, you know, make it easier to buy mm-hmm. curtains that make you happy, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, I think when you work around those sort of parameters, things get much more exciting. Is there, is there an organization in your opinion that's kind of, that, that has been able to achieve that balance between say, you know, the innovation elements, but also staying true to either a core purpose or, you know, what, what they're, you know, really after you kind of, look at it and say, you know what, they're, they're doing things right. You know, we talked about McDonald's and, you know, instilling those screens and, and whatnot, but is there, is there anything else that you, that you see right now out in the market? It could be in any industry uh, for that, for that point, but that you feel like, you know what, no, they, they, they have a purpose. They know what they're going for and they're adopt, adapting and innovating at the right rate. Yeah. I like this question a lot, actually. Um, and it's a post I've been meaning to do for a long time. Um, Cause often the companies that are doing this really well, they're actually not noticed that much. Exactly. Um, I, I think P and G did a mm-hmm. brilliant job. I did quite a lot of work with P&G about three years ago. You know, they were making sort of shampoos that didn't need any water. Um, they were making sort of products for demographics that were underserved. Um, mm. And they do an amazing job of, of making stuff that people buy that they don't really need, you know, ironing water, um, sort of things that get creases out of clothes. Like They, they, they do an amazing job of, of products and services that are quite interesting. Um you know, one of the most sort of disruptive ideas I think that's ever existed in business and makes a company billions of dollars a year um, is Nespresso from uh, Netflix. Mm. You know, we, we never talk about that, but we're much more likely to talk about 3D printed pizza than, you know, a sort of <laughs> multi-billion dollar business that, again, is actually bringing people quite a lot of happiness. Um, so P&G, so Nestle, um, I think airlines, you know, a company like Delta Airlines has actually done an incredible job of, of transforming itself and creating a really nice customer experience. Um, those would be some examples. Hmm. Awesome. Tom, this has been amazing. I, I'm really grateful for your time and sharing all your thoughts and ideas. Like this is just so 
refreshing to talk about these trends as though they're not something I'm missing out on. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <clears throat> I appreciate this. How can people find out more about you and the, and the things you're working on? Um, I have two ways, really. One is I've got a website, um, www.tgoodwin.me. Um, tgoodwin.me. That's uh, my sort of professional-looking website um, where you can find out boring things about me. Um, but the best way, <laughs> the best way really is to sort of follow me on, on, on uh, LinkedIn, probably. Uh, I think I'm Tom mm. F. Goodwin, I think. I mean, you can also follow me on Twitter, but I tend to be a bit more random there. Um, but yeah, um, LinkedIn, you'll get a good, uh, glimpse into my brain. Amazing. <laughs> this has been amazing, Tom. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending the time with us today. My pleasure. It's been really good fun. Awesome. All right. Is that okay? That was amazing. Yeah, that was amazing. That was so fun. <laughs> it was really good. This could have been easily a two hour this. podcast. Postpod. Now it's postpod time. Let's go. <laughs> I missed the you timing totally on that. missed the timing. I totally I, I counted down. I hit it. <laughs> I hit it at one instead of zero. Totally. So mm -hmm. now it's going to be. Uh, um, I'm trying to do it in my head. Odd post. Because I probably missed the P. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm finishing pod and you're saying. <laughs> Let's, Let's go. go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that was fun talking to Tom. Such a refreshing conversation. Um, yeah. I remember we, like, we, we did a podcast, like you and I, I don't know, I think it's like four podcasts ago, where we were talking about like, is marketing in trouble? And our conversation today, for me, came started coming back to this thought of like, are we pulling ourselves in too many different directions and we're mm -hmm. losing the, the core purpose of what it is that we need to do? And like yeah. these trends lists, get ready, everyone. Here they come. Yeah. Man, I mean, I got to be careful what I say around trends lists, but. Well, let me say something about trends lists because, I mean, you made a good point. There was from 2011, there was, you know, these trends that are existing and there's many of them that still exist today that haven't really changed. No, I mean, we talked about the metaverse for a long time, but. I feel like there's just, I think Tom said this, that, like there's this idea that you're missing FOMO, you're missing out on something. Yeah. And it's like this shiny metal object. You're like, well, spoon. Yeah. What, what? And you're like, oh, fork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're like, Oh, what about that? What about that? What? And so it's, it's this like distraction. Yeah. Keeping us from doing more important things, which is really rooting down into customer insights, figuring out like how we can just make what we do better totally for the customers. So it's easier for them yeah. and just get that right. And then apply the trends that are or emerging technologies that are relevant to us. Like that McDonald's example was amazing. And, and, and it's something that I don't think I would have ever thought about in a sense, like, Hey, no, that's extremely innovative. But when you think of the functionality and what it's probably done for their operations, that totally. that needs to be in the, you know, in, in the, in the, what's the right, what's the right word here, but like the case studies that we should be reviewing, it's like operational efficiency. Yeah. Well, here's, here's one thing McDonald's did that really helped that. Mm -hmm. But what, where we will read it is going to be in six years, maybe in a textbook. Yeah. That's being taught in a marketing class that now it's like, it, it needs to be more front and center, but instead we're like, we're celebrating like these, these metaverse mm -hmm. things. It was like, why? Why? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I struggle with that one so much, Mark. Like I just, yeah. I cannot, I cannot wrap my head around the why we need to be investing our dollars in that space. Well, funny enough, I was at Best Buy last night and <laughs> there's a, a, a metaverse headset and the hands things. And, and, and so I wanted to try it yeah, out just because, but it was fixed to the, the display unit. So I couldn't actually try it out. Yeah. But I mean, for all, I was sitting there looking at it going, huh, for all of the buzz around Metaverse, I know one person that owns a headset. Yeah. Like, and maybe I'm not in the right demo for that to, like, you know, someone might dismiss that. Um, 
but I genuinely don't know anybody that's got it. Like the regular stuff. Yeah, sure. There's like, you know, every, almost everybody I know has got like either a PS or an Xbox or yeah. whatever, but there isn't anybody I know that has a metaverse headset. And then we invest so much time and energy into trying to figure out how to make something AR VR yeah. um, without really any practical application for it. Like how's it going to make the customer experience better? And I think that's what it has to come down to. How are we rooting a lot of these trends into becoming more customer centric or better at being customer centric? And Mm -hmm. hence why, you know, I asked Tom that question, because I think that's where the disconnect continuously happens. So, like, if we go back to the metaverse and I I know listeners, you're probably thinking that we're picking on the metaverse, but how does it actually help being customer centric shopping Mm -hmm. in this in this ether versus like going through? a product display, a PDP page on a website. Why is that different? Mm -hmm. Just because you can spin Mm -hmm. it or you can, Mm -hmm. I I just, I think I struggle with where is that actually solving a problem where you and I know retailers that could spend their dollars doing things that are more fundamentally Mm -hmm. important in their operations. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you asked a question about the customer centricity, about whether companies are actually, really customer centric or not. And I, I thought that was such a great question. I, I got so excited <laughs> as you're asking, I'm like, Oh, this is going to be great. I can't wait to do it. Cause that's... But it, it's funny because you get, I mean, it's one of those, it's almost like a trend on its own yeah. where companies say, you know, customer centricity is almost a thing. And I, now as Tom was saying that I'm like, okay, I can picture a slide presentation uh, at a annual um, company corporate retreat of some kind or, or town hall where slide five is, Here's here's we're customer centric. Slide six is yeah. here's our experiment in yeah. the metaverse. Here's our approach. <laughs> here's, yeah. Slide seven is we're agile. You know what I mean? Like totally. there's all these things that I think we often get caught up in the buzz of today. And what I loved about Tom is he's just questioning them. Like, does it even make sense? Like we're repeating stuff. Does it even make sense what we're saying? He is such a great follow on LinkedIn. Without a yeah. doubt, because like yeah, maybe the voice of reason, maybe not the right way of articulating, but he just puts stuff out there that we've, as marketers, probably just we've taken in as truth now and says, hey, by the way, is this actually the way, like, again, the metaverse, is this actually what we need right now? And again, yeah. I'm not trying to poo-poo on like innovation and, and pushing yourself in different areas and, 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 and all that, like, I think there's extreme, I, I couldn't work for an organization if you just accepted status quo. So let's pick a different one just for yeah. argument's sake. Influencer marketing. Yes. Great one. Like replace influencer marketing with metaverse. Yeah. And all the stuff you just said is still true. That's fair. Yeah. NFTs, <clears throat> same, same thing. Like wh- where is that actually going? You know, blockchain, yeah. there is something in blockchain that will, yes, eventually help locking down the, you know, the idea of a, uh, ownership a digital asset yeah i i get mm-hmm. i get that but not in like the monkey thing like mm-hmm. i have zero there's zero value in that for me mm-hmm. I, at least i think and again maybe we are the wrong demo mark and uh, maybe that's why we maybe come across right now being completely naive um across some of this stuff but it just feels like it, it it's too far to actually mm-hmm. c- accept that this is a new normal that we have to yeah. be, we're been forced into. And you have your Gary V's like, oh my God, NFT is this, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but is it? Yeah. Well, and I think we, I don't think we recorded this, but just after we ended the recording with Tom, we were talking a bit a little bit about how much of the conversation paralleled trends and innovation. Yes. Like, the, or, or the conversation, we kind of were stepping on both sides of that yeah. line. And I never really made the connection before between trends and innovation uh, until today. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's not fair to say. I didn't think of it the, same, the same way context. as I did until, yeah. yeah. Um, and what I found interesting about that was like, yeah, all these things are there. It's like, I imagine I had toolbox and spreading out all the tools on the ground. And there's all these tools, like yeah. they're just tools. Yeah. So if you want to build something, you got to pick the right set of tools to build something. Yeah. Um, and it probably isn't useful to just randomly build weird things for nobody's use. Like there, maybe it is if you feel good about it. But if your goal is 
to be supporting a business, supporting the, you know, going back to customer centricity, improving customer experience. And you get to pick the right tools. It's not just about picking the tool that is promoted and in front of your face at that moment. You got to, I love that analogy. That are going to drive more value. I love that analogy because it's like we're being as, as marketers, again, we're being forced like, Oh my God, look at this new tool. So shiny. It's amazing. Then you're like, I'm going to go buy that tool. And you're going to try to find a way to use that tool. But you haven't probably identified that problem that that tool is needed for. So you're yeah. forcing the one before the other, right? So I think like, yeah. again, the, the idea of, um, again, we keep picking on Metaverse, damn it. We are picking on Meta- Metaverse. but Pick Beacons. Beacons. Be, oh, do you remember Beacons? In, yeah, it's like <laughs> like it was such a thing for us for a while. It, it was like in in the retail. I said, "Well, we want to have beacons in every you know in every category of the of the store to make sure like we we're yeah. tracking the flow of people, and then we can maybe ping them with something that there's a unique offer because now they walked by the footwear wall." Like, yeah, like, what? Yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, the customer is going, I just need a pair of shoes. Would somebody please get me a pair of shoes. <laughs> you, you've listed 30% off. Is it just over size there? 11? Exactly. <laughs> it wasn't solving a problem that had been identified. And I think that's where the disconnect is and why customer centricity or genuine customer centricity has to be the root cause and not the root cause, sorry, the root purpose of you selecting the right tools to solve a specific problem. And there's already yeah. so many out there. So before you start looking at the new tools that are available, just learn how to use the ones you already have really, mm-hmm. really well. The other point I loved that he made was, again, like marketing does a lot of work on insights in general. Mm-hmm. And we apply it to ads when we really should be doing a lot more with it. That was a great uh, and, point. And, yeah, and sharing it with the rest of the organization in places where it matters, like in product development yeah. um, or, or customer service or customer experience or sales or wherever, yeah. right? Like there's so much that could be done with voice of the customer data. Um, and it doesn't just have to apply to messaging and positioning. Like it's it's good there, but it, it, has, know, more it has value. Yeah. Elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I think it goes back to... Uh, the idea of that, remember when we were talking about like, you know, how do you increase communications across more departments and et cetera? I think yeah. it's because it's, it's like our data. So we try to protect it in and right. because we can defend it in its nature where it's happening. So it's easy for us to yeah. kind of say, oh my gosh, this ad was amazing because look at the reach it achieved, look at the click through yeah. rates and blah, 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 where those insights could be like, probably even more valuable, maybe on the product development side. Hey, we noticed this. Mm-hmm. This was what struck our, if we're genuinely the voice of the guest internally, or sorry, the voice of mm-hmm. consumers internally, we have to be thinking about these insights through an entirely different lens than a lot of us operate mm-hmm. at currently. Yeah. The other thing that uh, Tom was talking about is like, we're using data about the past to inform ideas about the future, which flashing back to Roger, Roger Martin's Martin. conversation, like, yeah, yeah there's no, it's the past. <laughs> like There is no data about the future. So, I mean, like you have to find some of these tests. And what I loved about his examples of, let's say, Hertz rental company, yeah. picking an entirely different model, creating five locations and seeing if it works. Yeah. And that story about the family connection yeah. is like has some of the same totally. ideas or, or uh, genetic composition yeah. as the parents. That's going to be, I think it's a really light. cool idea. Yeah. But it's interesting because then it, that's like an example of the thing that Roger was talking about, where you create tests and experiments for learning about what will work for the yeah. future. Cause you don't have that data for the past. No, exactly. Exactly. It's man. It, it, Tom has a, a beautiful way of really simplifying things and having mm-hmm. you almost like refocus. And, yeah. and I think that's extremely valuable that, you know, and, and I'm happy, obviously he's, he's doing really well. And it, I think it is important that we have individuals like that, that can kind of ground us once more in what actually matters. Mm-hmm. And there's extreme value in that. So man, I, I, we got to bring him on again. Like, yeah, that'd be great. Such a great conversation. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And uh, yeah, Tom, thanks for everything. That was really a great conversation. Yeah. V buddy. Another great pod. We're just on fire. 
Here we go. The year's <laughs> almost up, though, man. The year's almost done. I know. Can't I know. This it. is like our first year. We should have a party, a one-year birthday party for we, us. We should, actually. We, we should do a quick... We Actually, what we'll do is we'll do a nice little wrap-up uh, pod for the, the end of the year. Um, yeah. Just kind of reminisce around some of the great conversations we've had with the various guests, but... It's been a, it's been a, it's been awesome. Yeah, it's been great. Okay, buddy. Until next time. Adieu. <laughs> that, that might be our thing. <laughs> Is that it? Did we find it? I don't know. Maybe. Our sign uh, Maybe. Adieu. <laughs> Have a great day, yeah. buddy. You too, man. Good job. Yep. <laughs>